Good afternoon and thank you very much for uh, coming to this auditorium today. Let me introduce myself. I'm Bob Oakes from Morning Edition on WBUR, Boston's NPR news station. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure some of you are saying, wow, that's Bob Oakes? <laughs> I, I thought he was taller. I thought he was thinner. I thought he had more hair. And you know, the funny thing is that all those things were true last week. <laughs> Let me uh, uh, thank all of you for coming here this afternoon and thank the Boston Book Festival for having us. Don't they do a nice job? Isn't this a terrific event? Yes. Let's also thank the Plymouth Rock Foundation for sponsoring this particular session and say that without their generosity, it would be hard to put on events like this uh, that add to the cultural life that we all enjoy in this great city. So thanks to them. And in a way, that's what we're here to talk about this afternoon. The triumph of this city and all the city. The triumph of the city, that's the title of Harvard economics professor Ed Glazer's book. It's about what's made cities around the world great, about the challenges that they have had to overcome and still face. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes uh, in the special context of this city with our panel, and we'll take questions from you as well later. But first, to launch us off with a presentation, here's the author, Professor Ed Glazer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. And, and thank you all so much for being here. I'm so enormously flattered that you've decided to take time out of your Saturday afternoon to come and talk about, about cities. I'm also particularly grateful to the uh, Boston Book Festival for including this book. I mean, I, I like, I think every single one of you loves books. And I'm just thrilled to be part of this amazing thing that goes on here. Well, um, let me start. Let me start with a, a portrait of America. And I call it a portrait to make it really clear from the very start that I have absolutely no aesthetic sense whatsoever. Um, but this is a sort of a portrait. I've taken the 3,000 odd counties in this country and I've split them into tenths. Each dot represents roughly 300 counties on the basis of their density levels. Because at their heart, Cities are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are proximity, density, closeness. The bottom line shows the relationship between density and incomes. As you can see, there's a steadily increasing relationship there where the densest tenth of America's counties earn on average, on a per capita basis, 50% more than the people living in the least dense half of America's counties. This is a common phenomenon in the United States and throughout the world. The three largest metropolitan areas in this country produce 18% of our nation's GDP, almost a fifth, while including only 13% of America's population. The top line shows something that may be somewhat more surprising. It's the relationship between population growth between the years 2000 and 2010 at initial population density. And as you can see, until you get to the very top tenth, population growth goes up steadily with density. At the start of the 19th century, we were leaving our dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to spread out to take advantage of the enormous wealth of the American hinterland. At the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're clustering in. We're clamoring to be close to one another. Now, we see in Boston the resurgence of a great city. We see in New York, in San Francisco, in Seattle, in Chicago, all of these places, in London and Paris, we see the triumph of the developed world cities. But the success of the city in the developed world is nothing relative to what's happening in the developing world. We've recently reached that halfway point where more than half of humanity now lives in urbanized areas. And it's hard not to think that on net, that's a good thing, because when you compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have, on average, income levels that are five times higher and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. Gandhi famously said, the future of the nation, the growth of the nation, depends not on its cities, but on its villages. But with all due respect to the great man, on this one, he was completely and utterly wrong. Because, in fact, the future of India is not made in villages, which too often remain mired in the unending rural poverty that has plagued most of humanity throughout almost all of its existence. 
It is the cities. It is Bangalore. It is Kolkata. It is Mumbai. It is Delhi. It is Gargan that are the places that are the pathways out of poverty into prosperity. They are the places that are the conduits, the channels across civilizations and continents, and they're the place where India is transforming itself from a place that was practically a synonym for poverty and deprivation to a place that is, a, is bubbling with opportunity. Now, in some sense, the success of cities in the modern age is something of a paradox. We live in an age in which it is, distance is dead, in which every single one of us could all just telecommute in to whatever, you know, whatever business employs us, occupying, living in whatever sylvan spot appeals to our biophilia. And yet, in so many ways, in so many cases, we choose urban life. We choose the inconveniences, the high cost of living in urban areas, despite the fact that the techno prophets and the cyber seers 20 years ago predicted that all this new technology would make cities obsolete. And yet, Google, which of all the companies in the world should have access to the best long distance working technology, what do they do? They build the Googleplex so that their workers can be right next to one another. Silicon Valley, right? Practically the most famous geographic cluster in the world is also the industry which is the most technologically savvy. Why is it that all of this new technology, far from making face-to-face -face contact in the cities that enable it obsolete, seems to be hypercharging our cities? Now, this relatively rosy view of cities is very unlike the New York of my youth. These, I was born in Manhattan in 1967. I, I say that warily in, in the Boston Public Library, um, uh, but I was. And uh, these are two iconic images from my, from, from my youth. We could have similar images of New York, of Boston in the 1970s as well. The, the bottom image is, is of Gerald Ford denying uh, New York's request for a fiscal bailout. Ford didn't literally tell New York to drop dead, but lots of people think he meant it. And indeed, it looked as if New York was very much headed for the trash heap of history. The city had been hemorrhaging manufacturing jobs by the hundreds of thousands in the 1960s and early 70s. The largest industrial cluster in the US in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And that sector was decimated by globalization and new technologies. The city had been caught in a, in a spiral of disorder, rising crime rates racial conflict, just like here in, in Boston, and the fiscal situation had gotten out of control with budgets that were far too high for the city to afford. It looked as if New York was going to go back to the weeds, right? This is an image of, of Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland that, had, that the South Bronx had become, and it really seemed as if the Planet of the Apes image of, of the Statue of Liberty rising from the sand, that that was plausible that in fact these cities were things that had, you know, whose time had come and gone. In part, the future of the city seemed so dim because their original reason for being had largely disappeared. If you think about every one of America's older, colder cities, they were all part of solving a transportation problem. They were all nodes on a transportation network. If you go back to 1816, we as Americans sat on the edge of an enormously wealthy continent that was virtually inaccessible. In 1816, it cost as much to move goods 30 miles over land as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. It was so expensive to get goods in. Over the course of the 19th century, we built an amazing network. We built canals like the Erie and Illinois and Michigan Canal. We built railroads that supplemented the canals. And cities grew up at pinch points on that network, at Buffalo, the western uh, terminus of the Erie Canal. The oldest cities were typically where the river meets the sea, like Boston and New York. But every one of America's 20 largest cities in 1900 was on a major waterway. Chicago was a city whose future was made by two canals, Erie and Illinois and Michigan, that made it the linchpin of a watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans. And industries grew up around its, these, these transportation hubs. Chicago's most famous industry is, of course, its stockyards. And that's what you're looking at right now. Right? Those stockyards were part of the problem of getting the corn that America grows so well then and now, and it would even without utterly benighted agricultural policies followed by the, uh, followed by the federal government with subsidizing corn. That was a completely unnecessary aside. I apologize for that. Uh, but we would be very, very good at growing corn with or without those, su those subsidies. The problem was getting it to market. Originally, it was, it was moved over vast distances in that very portable, highly durable, and quite tasty form of whiskey. We then moved to pigs, which are, of course, corn with feet, 
which were able to be salted for some reason or other. Human beings have always preferred salted pork to salted, to, to salted beef. And then once this character, Armour, figures out about refrigerated rail cars, the key innovation being you put the blocks of ice on top rather than below the, the dressed beef so that w- cold water drips down, keeping the, the beef cold during the ship. 